God's Whisper. Anybody might have heard it, but God's whisper came to me, says the poet. God always whispers, at least to the soul. He may thunder to nations and speak to armies in the lightning, but to the individual his message is not in the mighty wind, nor the earthquake, nor the fire, but in the still, small voice. God lives in the bottom of the funnel of silence. He is the treasure concealed in solitude. He meets men alone in the dark. Congregations have their use, and books, and papers, and multitudes and friends, but God loves the silent way. He is every soul's most secret secret. If, as Thoreau said, it takes two to tell the truth, it takes also two to make a revelation. It takes the whisper of God and the listening man. God's whisper runs to and fro upon the earth. It might be heard in all cottages, palaces, marts, offices, inns, and councils. If only we listened. Go into the silence. Give your soul time to calm. Let the hurly-burly die down, the crash of passion, the struggle of doubt, the pain of failure, the ranklings of wrong, the clamour of ambition. Seize from self. Be still. Practice this. It is an art, and not to be mastered out of hand. Try it again and again, as patiently, as determinedly, as lovingly as one practices the violin or the making of a statute. And after a while, as virtuosity comes after long trials, there will come to life in you the needed sixth sense, by which you can hear the whisper. Some day you will get it. It may rise like a strange dawn in your consciousness. It may stir in you as life stirs in the egg. It may penetrate the deep chambers of your being as a strain of mystic music. And it will be the prize of life you will not be able to give it to another. Every man must receive such things himself. All of God's most vital secrets are marked non-transferable. But it will be yours, that which in all your life is most utterly yours. It will strengthen you in weakness, cheer you in hours of gloom. When you are at sea and confused, lost in the winds of casuistry, it will shine out as a pole star. When you are afraid, it will reinforce you as an army with banners. It will lull you to sleep with its music. It will give you poise. It will give you decision. No man can tell what the whisper says. Each soul must hear for itself. This is a great secret. One can only point the way. The way is silence. There stands God and says, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. Slovenly Thought Clean up your thought. Don't have your mind looking like the dining table after a banquet, or the floor after a political meeting. Sweep it and dust it, and put the ideas away where they belong. Don't have a wastebasket mind, or a top bureau drawer mind. It doesn't do you much good to have a grand idea, or a wonderful impression, or a strong passion if you don't know where to put it. I notice when I talk to you that you have a good many interesting notions. The trouble is that they are all higgledy-piggledy. They have no unity, coherence, order, organization. You think, but you don't think anything out. Your wheat is full of chaff. Perhaps I can help you if you will lend me your ear for a space. 1. Don't pick up some opinion you hear and make it your own because it sounds fine and go to passing it out without carefully examining it, scrutinizing, cross-questioning, and testing it. 2. One of the best tests of any opinion, not an infallible but a very valuable test, is will it work? If it won't, 
something's wrong with it nine times out of ten. That last brilliant notion of yours, hundreds of sensible people have had it and discarded it because it wouldn't work. 3. Don't let anybody make you think you owe a certain amount of belief in a thing simply because you can't disprove it. Nor be deceived by the argument, if that doesn't account for it, what does? You don't have to account for it at all. Some of the most pestiferous bunk has got itself established by this kind of reasoning. You don't have to believe or disbelieve everything that comes along. Most things you just hang up and wait. 4. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. It's a sign that you know what you do know. 5. Ask questions. Don't be ashamed of appearing ignorant. What you ought to be ashamed of is seeming to understand when you don't. 6. Classify. Education is nothing but the art of classification. Keep a scrapbook. Keep an index rerum, and classify. 7. Waste no time in acquiring general information. Always read and study with a purpose. Look up subjects, don't just read books. Books are to be referred to. Consulted, not to be read through, that is as a rule. 8. Be a friend and daily companion to the dictionary and encyclopedia. Look things up. 9. Define. Practice defining. Practice telling what a thing is not, as well as what it is. 10. Get a clear idea of what you don't know. Then you can see better what you do know. 11. Write. Not for publication, necessarily, but for yourself. Writing accustoms you to choose just the right words. Beware of adjectives, especially two of them. Favour nouns. Use simple, short words. They mean more, and carry further. 12. And never hurry or worry. Self-starters. What you need, man, is a self-starter. You go along alright when somebody cranks you up, but that kind of a machine is getting more and more out of style. You have fine staying qualities, but poor starting qualities. You have patience, perseverance, honesty, fidelity, and so on. But you don't seem to be able to start anything, including yourself. Now, good and faithful workers are needed in this world, for there's a deal of machinery to keep running, and chores to do. But there are also a lot of people to attend to such things, as they can't do anything else. If that's all you can do, or all you want or hope to do, well and good. I hope you'll get your due wages, be a faithful member of the party, and die in your bed. I throw no bricks at you. I hope you'll be respected, protected, and even, upon occasion, uplifted. But if you want to rise from the ranks, step out, and be somebody, he'll have to get you a self-starter. For only the self-starting folks arrive at the grand show on time to get an aisle seat up in front. I notice from your conversation that you lay a good deal of stress on luck and acquaintance and having a pool and all that sort of thing. I'm not denying these are good things. They help a fellow get along. But the trouble is, they are of value only to the man that can get along without them. Everybody helps him who helps himself. Nothing succeeds like success, and the only man everybody wants to lend money to is the banker. So, after all, there's nothing to it. Whatever you do, you must do it yourself. You must begin, anyway. You study too much about how to succeed, you consult other people's opinions, you are long on referendum and short on initiative. Nobody showed Marshall Field how to do business. Nobody was responsible for John D. Rockefeller's money except John D. Rockefeller himself. Nobody had to stand by and pat Admiral Dewey on the back and tell him to cheer up 
when he went after the Spanish fleet at Manila. And nobody cranked up Mark Twain or Lloyd George. They had self-starters. Go get you one. Con Mem Sarah Bernhardt, the Divine Sarah Some workers live long enough to reap the harvest of their achievement. To criticise them is absurd. To praise them is superfluous. No advertisement, whether by friend or enemy, can matter much. Time has underwritten them. We go to see Bernhardt, not as an entertainer, not as an actress, but as a miracle. We bring our state of mind with us. Nothing she can do could alter it. In her, we witness the astounding cumulative power of a personality. All that she has been builds the pedestal upon which is elevated what she does. That is what we mean when we say that there's nothing succeeds like success. We mean that all one's past energizes one's present. A man is not only what he is, but also what he has been. His power masses as he goes forward, increases like the rolling snowball. So we look at Bernhardt with wonder. She is an undying flame. Someone has said there are five elements. Earth, air, fire, water, and Sarah Bernhardt. To all who adore the indomitable will, and who does not, she is more than a human being, she is a symbol. She is like the motto on the red curtain of her show, Con Mem. Over insuperable obstacles, through storms of scorn and volleys of ridicule, past slander, in spite of financial reverses, afflicted with bodily ills that might have daunted the boldest, she still sits upon her throne, and though threescore and ten, with one leg amputated, she is able, at an age when anyone else would be seeking rest, to sway to passion an audience that imperfectly understands her language, and to send out from her undaunted spirit those flames of feeling that make brutes men and men divine. She is utterly an artist. She is utterly French. When I saw her last, she seemed France incarnate, France the eternal youth among the nations, France debonair and light of manner, yet with a purpose strong as destiny, France that knows her own high ideal, and in the face of enemies, adverse fate, and all hell, cries out, Con Mem. It is a poor soul indeed that can come away from seeing Bernhardt and not be nerved to a more splendid courage. She is a flag to all free spirits. The Pressure Always the pressure is on us. Like a low ceiling, it makes us forever stoop, often crawl, sometimes grovel. Like an unseen power, it hypnotizes us to go where we would not, to do what we hate, to say what we do not believe. Like a magnet, it draws us down, down with the innumerable feet that tread the broad way. Like a formless fear, it curtails our liberty, destroys our individuality, reduces us to the dead level of mediocrity. Like a huge spiritual press, it forces us into set, conventional, artificial shapes. As by a wave, a heaving decumen, we are swept on to corporate crimes, follies, cruelties, stupidities, of which as individuals we would not have dreamed. What is this pressure? It is that grey, shadowy mass we call they. The ghost fingers of the many manipulate us in little things as in great affairs. They determine our clothing, our speech, our manners, our morality, our sins. Scientifically, we name this adumbration heredity and environment. Against it, the soul of each man is in unceasing struggle. Most tragedies, from Iskulus to Ibsen, are descriptions of the desperate human unit striving hopelessly to free itself from this iron rim. They poisoned Socrates, crucified Jesus, burnt Savonarola, persecuted Wagner. 
It is this dull pressure, stolid, unintelligent, respectable, powerful, and brainless as the giants for Salt and Fafner, that obstructs all reforms, resists the application of reason to art, to letters, to economics, to government, to the spiritual life of men. Every ardent idealist impinges against it as against a wall of putty. It blocks prison reform, perpetuates child labour, smites capital with blindness, and labour with folly, keeps us under the bondage of an absurd system of weights and measures, ridicules spelling reform, delivers city politics into the hands of the boss and his organisation, impedes pure food laws, makes big business seek to bribe, intimidate, and control judges and legislatures, hinders rational reform in education, and whatnot. The pressure. Like a vice, it grips the society woman. In her straining to keep up with others, she has no time for her own life. In Europe, the idealist hating war, knowing it to be monstrous stupidity and waste, and an utterly inconclusive method of settling anything, is yet coerced to take his place in the ranks and try to kill the clerks and peasants of another country against whom he has no quarrel in the world. The pressure. Once it made men burn heretics and witches. It seems sometimes to our fancy as if it were a vast, immeasurable spirit of death. Monstrum horrendum, informe, ingens, quilumen ademptum, that doth bestride the narrow world, like a colossus and we petty men, walk under his huge legs and peep about, to find ourselves dishonourable graves. <laughs>